Among the physics body nodes, there is one in particular that often ends up being the backbone of most Gonite games. But why is that? What are kinematic bodies? Well, put shortly, they're effectively static bodies with a bit of extra baggage, giving them the ability to, as their name suggests, move kinematically. Or in other words, move and react to collisions while ignoring the physics engine. Said movement is facilitated by the kinematic body's unique move and family of functions. Those being move and glide, move and slide, and move and slide with snap each having their own very important behavioral differences. So how do these functions work? Well, let's start with the most basic of the trio, being made of only four arguments, with the first two being shared between all of them, the move and collide function, which it does exactly as you would expect. Move the body along a given vector, stopping when it would collide with another body, and returning any information related to that collision. Take note that information will be returned in the form of either a kinematic collision or kinematic collision 2D, depending on the type of environment you're working in. Now beyond that, let's go over the previously mentioned vector, which is defined within the function's first argument, which will be either 2D or 3D depending on the environment type. This is true for any vectors, so keep that in mind. Past that, the next argument is a bool representing if the body will have quote-unquote infinite inertia. This dictates how it interacts with rigid body nodes, with the default value of true causing the body to effectively ignore collisions with rigid bodies and push them out of the way regardless of weight or mass, to the point where they will even be pushed inside of or through other bodies when not able to get out of the way. However, when set to false, the body will, generally, be unable to push rigid bodies at all even if the mass and weight are as low as possible. Personally, I tend to prefer setting this to false as it's easier to control interactions that way. Following that is another bool, which at first glance may seem a bit strange to even have as an option. As when it's set to its default of true, the movement will ignore any collisions that involve recast shapes, and when it's set to false, it'll do the opposite. Now, the reason this is here as an option is because moving collide is typically used more for testing if a collision will happen rather than for actual movement itself. And with that in mind, raycast shapes are usually used more as whiskers to detect the ground or other objects in order to keep consistent movement up and down slopes and so on rather than as true traditional collision shapes. So it's sometimes better to ignore them when trying to test if a certain movement will cause a collision or not. And that's where our next and final argument comes in. Being yet another bool, this time defaulted to false, representing the test only option which is aptly named as if it's set to true, it causes the method to simply check if a given movement would cause a collision, and if so, return any collision data without actually moving the body itself. This can be great for many things, like helping AI figure out where it's going and what certain movements would collide with and where. Though if you strictly want to see if a collision would happen and don't care about its context, there is another, more simplified method, test move, that does a test movement between a specified starting position, given as the method's first argument, and ending position, the method's second argument, with the final argument representing if the movement would have infinite inertia. This method is less computationally taxing than move and collide, but only returns a bool. And that's all there is to move and collide, but what about its cousin, the move and slide function? Well, with six arguments, two of which are shared with the previous, it also moves the body, but with some big differences. Primarily being that when the body collides, it'll slide rather than come to a complete stop. Now, one of the two mentioned shared arguments is the first, which is the vector that determines the body's movement. There is, however, a significant difference in how this vector works, though, as it's automatically multiplied by the delta of the physics process. That's why it seems like move and collide move so much further with the same input if you were to test them side by side. This is done because move and slide's intended purpose is actual movement, and multiplying the vector by the delta is something you would almost always want to do, as it makes the movement consistent. This does mean, though, that you'll want to make sure and only use this function or methods that use this function within the physics process, otherwise the movement will be all wrong. And after that is the first unique argument, another vector, this time representing the up direction. This argument is how the body knows if it's on the ground, wall, or ceiling, and has a huge impact on how the function behaves. Such as with the next argument, stop on slope. A bool, defaulted to false, controlling of the body will slide down slopes when its movement vector is straight down, or, in other words, when the body isn't moving and is just being pulled down by gravity, with down being relative to the previously established up direction. The next argument is an integer, defaulted to 4, which represents the maximum number of times the body can slide per step. This isn't something you'll often find yourself having to mess with, as a large number of slides per step only, typically, comes up in games with a lot of complex geometry or where characters are moving really fast, as either will exponentially increase the probability of multiple slides. Past to that is an argument defaulted to the radian equivalent of 45 degrees, which represents the maximum floor and ceiling angles. 
As you probably expect, this is used to give up direction a bit more context so the body can more effectively determine if it's touching a floor, wall, or ceiling. And finally, we come to the last argument, which is actually the other argument Move and Slide shares with Move and Collide, the bull representing infinite inertia, which works exactly the same here as it did there. So after that, we can move on to the last variation of the move and functions, move and slide with snap, which is almost identical to its less wordy brother outside of one very impactful difference. It has the ability to snap onto slopes. This behavior is controlled by its only unique argument, which is added right between the movement vector and up direction. Said argument itself is also a vector, which at first glance you may think is for a raycast to detect compatible slopes for the body to snap to. And you'd be on the right track, but it's a bit more complicated than that. So I'll go over what the function does in sequence. First, it moves the body exactly the same way move and slide would. Then, if it's on a floor post movement, that's it. It stays where the movement brought it. But if not, it will then check if it was on a floor during the previous physics step. If it was, and the snap vector isn't all zeros, the function will then do an extra movement along the snap vector to see if that movement would collide with a floor. If not, then the body stays where it was at the end of the initial movement. But if the test movement did hit a floor, then the body will be snapped to that floor. Keep in mind that the faster you have the body moving, the larger the snap vector needs to be in order to work. As the further it moves per physics step, the further down the test movement will have to go in order to reach a given slope. Though take note that the larger the snap vector is, the more computationally taxing it is. And you also need to keep in mind that it is very possible to have too large of a snap vector to where it'll basically just teleport to a floor below it whenever it goes off a ledge. So I always recommend to play around with this argument to try and find the perfect vector for your needs. On top of all that, there is another complexity to consider when using move and slide with snap. That being that it's normally impossible to jump while using it. This is because if the movement vector doesn't get you high enough to be out of range of the snap vector within the first physics step, the body will just be snapped right back down to the ground. There is a simple solution for this though. The moment the body would go to jump, set the snap vector to be all zeros, and then reset it back to what it would have been originally on the next physics step. This allows the body to get off the floor, and then since it's been off the ground on the previous physics step, it won't get snapped back down. So you would think that would be all there is to know about the move and functions, and technically you'd be correct, but there are several functions within kinematic bodies that directly relate to the move and slide and move and slide with snap functions. The first three of which are is on floor, is on ceiling, and is on wall, all of which doing exactly what you would expect. Returning a bull representing if the body was touching their corresponding surface the last time you called either of the previously mentioned functions. And as you would likely suspect, these are all incredibly useful for triggering animations, determining if the player or NPC can perform a certain action, and so on. Following those are another two functions, get slide count and get slide collision. These functions are how you actually get information on the collisions from the move and slide functions, with the first getting the number of times a body collided with, aka slid against, other bodies during the last time you called either of the functions. And the second gives you the actual collision information of whatever collision you gave it the index for in the form of a kinematic collision or kinematic collision 2D, whichever is appropriate. These two functions are usually used together in order to either loop through and get data on each thing the body had collided with, or just get data on whatever the final thing the body collided with was. Then next up is another group of two, being get floor velocity and get floor normal. Both, of course, only work if the body was actually on the floor during the previous physics step, with them doing exactly what they sound like. The former returning the velocity of said floor, and the latter returning the floor's normal, or in other words, a vector representing the direction said floor was pointing. And now, after all that, we come to the final piece of this kinematic body puzzle, the 2D exclusive property, Sync to Physics, which does two things. Firstly, disabling both move and slide functions, and then making it so all other movement, whether it be from directly altering the body's position within a script or moving it with an animation player, is synced to the physics engine. This is really important for making things like moving platforms because it ensures that the body's recorded velocity is always accurate to its current movement. That's why when you try to make a platform without sync to physics, other bodies on top of it seem to drift around a little every time said platform changes directions or slows down. As the bodies are using the platform's velocity from the previous physics step for determining their motion, causing them to always be a frame behind. Sync to physics fixes this by effectively making the platform's motion happen at the same time its linear velocity would be updated. Which in turn makes it so all bodies on top of the platform will read the right velocity and no longer drift around. And that's it. Effectively all there is to know about kinematic bodies and how to use them. 
If you have any feedback or suggestions for the topics to cover, please don't forget to leave a comment. And if you want to stay up to date with my content, make sure to subscribe. And with all that out of the way, I'll see you on the next video.